what an honor <laughs> for me to be here to moderate the two of you and in such a, an amazing uh, subject because I'm also, of course, very much interested in that. I have my own theories or hypotheses, let's say, and so I would really like to uh, see your views. So I don't know where to start, maybe something that is farther away from my uh, expertise, so maybe Anders, if you want to uh, start with, what do you think about life elsewhere? Do you think mm. there is some chance that there is life beyond uh, the Earth? Yes, but I, I like to do an excursion just linking to the previous panel. Sure. Uh, it might seem strange that somebody from the Future of Humanity Institute is interested in extraterrestrial life and intelligence. Isn't it about humanity? But of course, if we could look at the sky and see alien civilizations thriving or crashing, we would know something about our own chances. An empty sky is telling us something, but we don't quite know what, and it might be a very disturbing message. So that's how I got involved with, with all of this. Now, I think in many ways it's good news. I think there is life el elsewhere, simply because the universe is probably, in my opinion, infinite in extent. So you can't avoid life just by random chance. But I do think it's sparsely populated. I don't know about the chances of life, but I think intelligence is very scarce. But I hope we will eventually meet them. Okay. And I think we can do studies to actually turn this into more than a hope. I think we can actually figure out things about the world that helps us answer these questions and do indeed give us some hints about how, what our own chances are, as well as what we might want to do with the universe. Because um, in the long run, I think we'll go out there and that is going to be rather important for the survival, not just of us, but for life itself. Yes, because I think also we have to make... Uh, a distinction between, uh, say, life uh, as, uh, say, for example, simple forms of life and civilized life. Mm. So I guess you were talking about more advanced uh, life or in general, because uh, I don't know. My point of view is that considering uh, the, the, you know, the number of molecules and the, that are present in our galaxies and beyond, as I was saying this morning, it seems to me kind of natural that we have to have some kind of, uh, at least the simple forms of life, uh, widespread. Yeah, but if we say there is a lot of sites and times where life could appear right. and then multiply it with a reasonable probability and we should get a big number, the problem is the reasonable probability. Where do we get it from? This is one of the most uncertain numbers in science. I have argued in one paper that we have about a hundred orders of magnitude of uncertainty. It could be that life spontaneously emerges in every puddle on an Earth-like planet at a rate of once a month. Or it could be that actually it literally takes a Googleplex and uh, Earths to get it. We don't know, right. but this is where science comes in. This is where we actually can do experiments. Okay, so then let me go to the other. So now we're <laughs> okay. here, we, we have an expert on the exoplanets, oh and what, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I could give you my own opinion, but I don't think this is the point here. I, I think what is what's interesting to, um, to realize right now is you can argue, you can debate on that endlessly. Um, it's not science. Mm -hmm. uh, when it becomes science is when you become some, f you have some fact that bring you some element to start building, building up, let's call it probability. Yeah. So we have to admit today we don't have very much, um, but, but what I do think is there will be a lot more to come in the future. Um, there is a couple of facts that we have just to face. One fact, we have to know, understand that the planetary formation process is kind of a generic formation process everywhere in the universe. So when you form a star, you form planets. Um, now, the kind of planet you may form may not be exactly the one we have in the solar system, but it's very likely there will be at least some of them that would be kind of similar to the solar system. Now, there's so many stars, the universe is so vast, it's not strictly speaking infinite, but you can see it as an infinite from the human perspective, definitely, um, that the chemistry being the same everywhere, it just doesn't make any sense to imagine that the beginning of life didn't happen elsewhere. No, the fact you have the beginning of life somewhere as a kind of a big chemical experiment doesn't mean that you will develop life. Doesn't mean that life will become 
uh, will reach a level to build a cell. We'll be talking about that. Doesn't mean you will build up something which, uh, that would become visible. Doesn't mean the life would impact on the atmosphere of the planet. But in some cases, they may, if the conditions are good. So in terms of life, Elsewhere, there is so much progress has been done in terms of uh, the tools we're using to detect planet, the tools we're using to try to get something from the atmosphere of this planet, and the tool we are about to build in the next hundred years. We will at least have enough tools to look for it. And, and what we will know, I don't know, but certainly we will be looking for it. Now, the reason why I'm interested for that is because I just can't accept that life only happens on this planetary system. And I do think that it must be elsewhere. But as a scientist, it remains to be found. Yes, yes, definitely. And I guess now with the, the powerful telescope we have in space, JWST, but also with future telescopes like the ELT that will be built uh, in the next years, I think we will go very deep into the understanding the composition uh, also of terrestrial-like planets. You know? I think we also need to distinguish between uh, which type of planets we are talking about, because we need to have uh, a focus on what... Uh, okay, we are biased because we are in an habitable planet, but this is what we are looking for. No? We are looking for planets where th there is the condition that water can also be liquid, uh, etc. So what are your, uh, say, perspective, say, for the future to actually see, I don't know, some either biosignature, but even not biosignature, but say some chemical compositions that could uh, tell us about uh, some inequilibrium chemistry that could be due to life for this future uh, and also present instrumentation. So JWST and ELT, I don't know if uh, you have been... Yeah, Thinking okay. So there is a lot future. of, uh, I mean, technical element here, but I think there is two categories of work right. that is going to happen uh, in the next 50 years. One of them is the systematic exploration of the solar system. Yeah. And, and, and very, very critical is the fact that in 20 years, we're going to bring back samples from Mars. I think the last time we brought back things from elsewhere than the Earth was 50 years ago from the Moon. And the Moon is a kind of a boring element because it's built from the structure of the Earth. So in a way, we, what we found is some kind of imprint how the Earth was at the time the Moon was formed. Now, Mars is a completely another story. Uh, we have a fantastic robot, I know, but, but the techni technology which is embarked and the capability of the robot is extremely uh, simple. And they will do simple, enough, I mean, studies, already very interesting. Uh, but the real game here is when you bring pieces of Mars on Earth and you use this fantastic tool that we have to study the very detailed chemistry that has happened at the time. And Mars is about how we can think the Earth after one billion years, which is a time when everybody would agree that life is clearly on Earth, but has not change anything into the atmosphere yet. So this is really something that's going to happen. And then you can talk about Venus. I think we have, have this discussion whether there is some possibility of life, not on the surface, but maybe flying around into Venus. You know, look, Venus maybe in the past was like the Earth. We don't really know whether they had water or not on Venus. So, so this kind of debate is certainly open right now in the air. And then you can go for Titan and Celadus. So all this is going to happen because the technology is going to bring back. And the level of study that we will learn from that may be a big surprise for maybe other kind of life. Now, what you're talking about is planet on other stars then it's unlikely we will ever go there because of the size, the energy, it's too complicated to go. It would be very extremely limited to send tiny probes to, this, uh, to these not places. Yet. Well, yeah, okay, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to, uh, to accept this. A anyway, I mean, <laughs> we don't take many much risk, and <laughs> even if whatever we claim at that time, it's not going to happen in the next 100 years. So, so the question is, what can you say about life uh, on other planet. And then, and then you have to look back on Earth. And essentially, for a long time, you had a lot of life on Earth, but it was essentially invisible. And then something massive happened, which is a great oxygenation, and completely changed uh, the structure of the atmosphere. And at that moment, which is about two billion years ago, the fact that there is life on Earth was just blatant. 
Um, so I keep saying, so when I keep hearing people, oh, we should be worried in case there is extraterrestrial civilization looking at us, we should be careful not to make noise. This is a big joke because we're already visible since two billion years. So, <laughs> so if there is real civilization able to travel into space and visiting us, either they're already there somewhere, maybe in the audience here, and they're quite laughing about the discussion, or they just... They know we are there, but they never manage to reach us. That's why traveling into galaxies, traveling into, into, uh, into stars, I'm a little bit skeptical right now, just on this simple yes. fact. But we are very visible, I think, life. So maybe when we be starting pointing, maybe not this telescope, but the next generation of the next generation of telescope uh, to some of these kind of Earth-like planet around Earth, and they will plenty, we will be seeing some of them with an event like will be similar to the Great Oxygenations, and people will say, oh, maybe something similar happened on that planet. Yes. So this is really what is going to happen in the future. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's great, because in fact, there is also a lot of studies going on on the looking at the history of the atmosphere of our planet and reproduce the spectra, and this, of course, could be a good template for future observations. But anyway, Anders, what, who, would you like to do uh, for, say, uh, I don't know, to improve or to, to do something more quantitative in terms of, uh, as Dider was saying, you know, we, need, we are scientists, so we, we need mm. uh, to, to have uh, some proofs. Uh, what would yeah. you... So, so the obvious thing is uh, investigate uh, the solar system, turn over every rock and try yeah. to see what's there. Uh, one idea that's fairly old is panspermia, the idea that life might be spreading between planets. <clears throat> it used to be the idea, uh, kind of a very inquate idea, and then it got more concrete when we found actually Mars meteorites on Earth. Because there is an exchange between planets where meteorites hit them and various things splatter off. And yeah. spores could perhaps travel, so at least within the solar system. It's not implausible that life might have been moving around. So if we find life on Mars and find that it's Earth-like, that's good news in the sense that, okay, there might be life elsewhere in the solar system, but it might also spread between nearby solar systems. We should actually update our belief in uh, life elsewhere in the universe. If we go to Mars, or maybe Titan, <coughs> and find life that's not like ours, then we suddenly got a very powerful piece of evidence that life can emerge that is very different. We should expect life everywhere. And at that point, of course, the silence of the sky becomes slightly more creepy. Hmm. Because why are there no intelligent species out there if there's a lot of life? So this, in my world, is called the great filter question. Is the great filter that life is really rare, or that complex life is really rare, or that complex intelligent life tends to wipe itself out to go somewhere else? The future in the great filter. <laughs> we really would like to know where it's located. There has to be one, otherwise there would be billboards on the moon and flying saucers everywhere on the Stockholm parking lots, and there aren't. <laughs> so we get evidence here, and even weak evidence when you don't know very much moves your beliefs. So this is something I've been working on, trying to look at the famous Drake equation that multiplies together various factors to get a es loose estimate of how much uh, intelligence there might be out there. Some of the factors have changed over time as we know more. It's kind of fun to notice that the first uh, two factors, now we know them perfectly well, especially the number of Earth-like plants per star. It's great. We nail it down. And then we have some of the middle factors where we don't really know very much. And then there is the ominous last factor. How long does uh, the civilizations that could communicate last? And that's part of my other research. I'm generally optimistic. If we manage to survive and get our act together, which I think is a big if, but then I do think that in the long run, we're going to be around for a very long time. And this is actually an area where the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was earlier than many of us catastrophe researchers in asking questions, how long do a typical civilization last? They actually had uh, some attempts in the 60s and 70s to write papers about it. We might mildly laugh at the methodology today, but they were ahead of us in the philosophy department, in the existential risk research groups. They actually led the groundwork. It's been extremely useful for also trying to save us on Earth. Yes. So think about uh, how much we can do if we are able to survive on the planet for the next uh, you know, centuries. So we can do so much and maybe even, uh, yeah, communicate. I mean, we will have big telescopes uh, coming up. There is a starting uh, actually a few days ago of the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, that in fact Sweden is very much involved with that. So that also one of the topics will be indeed to 
try to find the signals uh, of, of uh, intelligent civilization. We will see, of course, yes, this, we don't know the probabilities. As we said before, has an error bar of uh, <laughs> orders, hundreds of orders yeah, of magnitude, so we, we cannot really tell, but uh, definitely we have to move on. About the fact that this panspermia, this was in fact, uh, I remember uh, Fred Hoyle was one uh, very famous astrophysicist. In fact, he is the, my inspirator that in fact was talking about this panspermia. I mean, indeed, we have meteorites theoretic material coming from Mars, so it's not uh, indeed uh, ruled out uh, at all. Yeah. So, but, but it yeah. also leads to an interesting ethical problem. When we start exploring the solar system, we yes. are going to bring Earth life, with, uh, Earth life with us, simply because it's hard to sterilize well enough, because bacteria and spores are really good at getting around. And right now we're mostly concerned that this might interrupt the science, because if you find something on Mars, you better prove that it's not uh, actually coming from Earth. But I have acquaintances that say we have a moral duty to spread life in the universe. The universe looks lifeless. We better take this test tube full of spores and spread it among the stars. And I have other friends saying, no, that would be the worst thing ever. There's some rather strong philosophical arguments that um, we should be extremely careful about seeding life because if you say that pleasure and pain are the main things and say that mm, actually a lot of wild animals are suffering. If I fill a million planets with life, that's a million uh, biospheres full of suffering, which by some philosophical views have made the universe much worse. I have other philosophers who said, no, 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 it's a million or a trillion times better. We have an interesting disagreement here that we better resolve before my other friend sends off that test tube into space. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So Didier, I don't know if you want to say some more. We have just two minutes yeah, well, left. Yeah, well, I, I would like to react to two, two things that you said. I think um, I understand that there is material moving around between the planet, which is absolutely valid. No, there is still a problem with that. Let's imagine you take um, something growing in Stockholm and you bring it back in the Sahara. Do you think there is any chance it will grow? No. So I think if you think life as being a fitness problem in terms of optimization of chemistry to a specific planet, and if the planet is slightly different, when you move it, that's it. It dies. So the idea that you can move something alive from one place to another one is not something straightforward. You would need something that gives you a fitness advantage at the, the very location. And since the way you build up the chemistry of life is very likely an optimization problem, you too much optimize for the planet, moving to another one, you would be dying. So I'm not a great fan of transpermia. Just on this factual yeah. argument that you can use, it's an experiment you can do, bring some plant here and move it to Sarah, you will see. It's an experimental work. <laughs> now there is another element about the idea of, uh, of intelligence life. I must say this, I don't use it quite often because I don't like it. <laughs> because I think some sometimes the fish are more intelligent than us. So the concept of intelligence is something which is a little bit difficult to use. So you can talk about uh, advanced technology uh, capabilities to travel into space. That is certainly something valid or advanced technology to communicate through different planets. That's certainly valid. Now, the question behind this is, you can do whatever you like, but there is a point when you break the law of physics, and this is a no-no. So there is one law, which is the speed of light. So you will never break the speed of light, and if you go too close, you will be so much massive, so the energy you need is essentially the energy of the universe to get you at that speed or to slow you down. So there is an intrinsic challenge here in a way you could travel to another stars. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I say you're close to physical limit. So according to the physics we understand as if today, and up to now, the law of Einstein has not been disproved. That's even the opposite. They have been extremely strongly, and gravitational waves, black holes, all what we, we're seeing in this, this Nobel event, I mean, it's related to this law of physics. Now, I'm still a little bit skeptical about the idea of civilization and talking to civilizations. The day I will start believing this is when somebody will demonstrate to me an experiment where they can talk to the red fish they have uh, in, the, in the apartment, in the aquarium. If you can talk to your fish, maybe you can talk to extraterrestrial um, intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with this, uh, uh, we stop because we have no more time. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.